So you, can you see now that the Song of Songs, it's all about the bridal paradigm. It's about the church's relationship to King Jesus as the bride being presented to the bridegroom. Now, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse number four of chapter one. I do encourage you to get this entire teaching. You can get it through the contact information at the end of the broadcast today. I also highly encourage you to get your Bible out every week as we're going through the Song of Songs and get a notebook out. This study, beloved, can change your life forever. It changed mine. Here we go. The bride has gotten a taste of the beauty of Jesus. She's been kissed with the kisses of his word. He's made himself known to her. As a result, her heart has opened up to him. She's praising him. She's telling him how beautiful he is. Your, your name, she said, is like purified oil. Your, your, your fragrance, she said, is so beautiful to me. In verse number one and, uh, and through, through, through three there, your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. She's had this encounter. She's realized how beautiful he is. And she's captivated by it. She's, she's obsessed with it. She, she's lovesick over him. She's pursuing him passionately. Now she continues on in verse 4. Draw me after you and let us run together. And then she says, the king has brought me into his chambers. This is where I left off last week. The first thing she says is, draw me after you. In other words, deliver me by your power from everything that's hindering love. Draw me to yourself. I don't have the power to come alone. There's things in the way that are going to keep me from fully giving myself to you. There's things that I'm hanging on to. There's things that I'm afraid to let go of. There's things that I'm addicted to. There's generational spirits operating in my mind and, and subconscious. Draw me after you that there might be nothing that would separate me from your love. You see, Jesus taught this same thing in John 6 when he said, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so, Father, we're going to, beloved, I'm talking to you first. We're going to turn this into a prayer dialogue. This is the way we're going through the Song of Songs together. So let's pray that. Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you draw your church to yourself. We thank you that you're drawing me to you. And now we ask you to continue to draw us to yourself. Draw us to you, Jesus. Draw us into oneness with you and into marital intimacy. Because we have been called your bride and we are destined to sit with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Do it in this life, we pray. Reveal yourself to us in this life. Draw us to yourself right now. Amen. And then she continues on and she says, let us run together. Now this has to do, beloved, with her assignment on earth. That she's interested in experiencing him. She's interested in being with him. She's interested in partnering with him in intimate fellowship. But she's also interested, beloved, in running with him. And this has to do, beloved, with partnering with Jesus in ministry. See, the Bible says that we are co-laborers with Jesus on this earth. That we've been given the assignment, beloved, as his church of winning the lost, of seeking the lost, of, of bringing deliverance to people, of preaching the gospel, of being instruments of love and healing and peace, of being instruments of, of the Holy Spirit's presence on the earth. The Bible says we're the light of the world. We, we're, we're involved in doing the works of Jesus and being his witnesses. And so she says, draw me to you. But also she says, I want to run with you. I want to do, Jesus, what you did on earth. Jesus said, he that believes in me, greater works than these shall he also do. So we want to have that balance in our life. On the one hand, we want to be spending time alone with God. Draw me to yourself, God. We want to spend that time just sitting with him every day listening to beautiful vertical worship music in every day, spending time just being silent before him every day, spending time reading his word, spending time listening to messages preached to the truth, spending time in fellowship with people. We want to do those things that will draw us into deeper fellowship with Jesus. 
but we also, beloved, want to run with them. We want to be involved in doing the works of the gospel. You see, that's why we read about the high priest of ancient Israel. At the bottom of his robe, he had a bell and then a pomegranate, a bell and then a pomegranate, a bell and then a pomegranate. It takes the fruit of the Holy Spirit that comes to us as we're spending time with Jesus, being drawn to him, but then it also takes, beloved, the works of Jesus, which is represented by the bell. You can hear the bell. You can see the bell. I think of a story that just took place a few weeks back. I went uh, to a restaurant with a pastor friend of mine, and he had been going there for some time, and he had developed a relationship with the waitress over, over the years, but he never got to the place where he told her about Jesus. She sensed there was something different about him. She sensed the love in him. She sensed the positive plus factor of God in him. When we walked in the wet restaurant, she actually gave him a hug. When she got to the table, she already knew what he was going to order. She just wrote down his usual. So they had this beautiful relationship that came from the love of God. I had never met her before. When she got to me, I had spent a little time just uh, uh, talking with her briefly. And then at the end of the meal, when she came back towards the end, I pointed to my bracelet that I wear. And this is called uh, the What Do You Think of Jesus bracelet. It, is, it says W-D-Y-T-O-J. For more information, you can order the series, What Do You Think of Jesus? But the Lord gave me this question prophetically in a dream when he revealed to me in a dream that he wanted me to be asking the world the question, and he wants you to be asking the world the question, those of you that are his children that are watching right now, the specific question, what do you think of Jesus? And so I said to the waitress at the end of the meal, I said, I said if you can guess what my bracelet means, I'll give you $5 additional for your tip. Well, she couldn't do it. We had a good time. And I told her what it meant. I said, this is what it means. It means, what do you think of Jesus? I said, the Lord told me prophetically in a dream that he wanted me to be asking people that question. And then I explained to her, the point is this, that the Lord loves people individually and specifically and purposely. Purposely. I want, I want, to, I want to ask you, I said to her, what do you think of Jesus? And then she said, well, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to come back. So then she came back, and as she came back, she said, you know, you really asked me this at a good time. She says, because I've just started thinking about these types of things. She really didn't know who Jesus was. She thought he was just one of many, but I began to share with her who Jesus was. I began to bring her through some of the great foundational truths of salvation and the good news of the gospel. And then after I had taken about seven minutes or so, I said, you know, I don't want, I realize you have other tables that you, you need to be waiting on here. She said, no, I really don't. I, I'm free right now. I mean, she was so hungry. She was so ripe. She was so prepared. And basically, beloved, I believe that she was brought into the beginning of a salvation experience that day. The point is, it took both the, the love of, that my friend had, that he had developed in his life from spending time alone with God and being with God, but it also took the verbal working of my mouth in specifically asking her, what do you think of Jesus, for her to come to this salvation encounter, the beginning of her salvation experience, I believe. God's drawn her in through that. The point is, beloved, we share in the assignment of Jesus. So she said, I want to run with you. So the running was that I was out there, listen now, being a witness. Jesus said to his disciples at the end of the gospel, he said, now I want you to go wait in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you'll be clothed with fire and power, and you shall be my witnesses. And so this is part of running with God. We're his witnesses now. As the Father sent me, Jesus said again, so I also now send you. You see, I was running with Jesus when I said to this waitress, what do you think of Jesus? So if we're going to partner with Jesus, if we're going to know him intimately, we also need to be partnering with him, beloved, in running the race of, of, of ministry on this earth because Jesus, beloved, has an assignment in this world. He came to the world to do the will of the Father, and now that he's ascended to heaven, he's given his church the mission of carrying this on. So we want to be drawn to him, but also run with him in, in carrying on the assignment, amen, of the Father. So we'll read that again, and then we'll continue on to the next verse. Are you with me, beloved? The Lord, the Father loves you. Yeshua loves you. I just felt the Spirit of the Lord communicate that to you. Here we go again. Draw me after you. 
and let us run together. And then she says this, the king has brought me into his chambers. Draw me after you and let us run together. And then she says, the king has brought me into his chambers. Now remember, this is a song of divine romance. This is the song of two lovers. This is a bridal chamber. And so she's talking about an intimate encounter. She is talking about, you know what? I've experienced the beauty of my bridegroom king. I've experienced intimacy with him. I've experienced his joy and his love. And we spoke about this in some of the earlier broadcasts. One of my favorite scriptures is John chapter 14, verse 21 and 23, where Yeshua promises this to us. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my word. And then he said, and then I'm going to come to you, listen now, and disclose myself, reveal myself, manifest myself, make myself known to you. I'm going to make you feel me. So if you love me, he said, you're going to obey me. And then I'm going to come to you and my father's going to come to you and we're going to reveal ourselves to you. This is what she's speaking of here. The king has brought me into his chambers. When Jesus reveals himself to us, manifests himself to us, communicates himself to us, like he tells us about in John 14, 21 and 23, this is a bridegroom chamber experience. Aren't you thankful, beloved, that God is going to reveal himself to you during the course of your life's journey on this earth? It's true that now we just see through a glass dimly, but it doesn't mean we have to wait to go to heaven to experience anything. No, we've been given the Holy Spirit now, according to the book of Ephesians, as a pledge of our inheritance. Even now, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us these prideful love experiences in Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit, beloved, has been given to us to reveal unto us the beauty of God the love of God, the mysteries of God, how the Father feels about us, the joy of, 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 of unity with Him. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's been given to us and is revealing to us those things that have been given to us by God. In other words, that eye is not seen and ear is not heard, neither has it ever entered into the heart of man the things that are ours, and the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit's been given to us that we might know these things. And so the Shulamite bride here, who's a shadow of you and me, a shadow of the church, she's had some of these experiences. She said, the king brought me into his chamber. And I want to encourage you to begin to pray to Jesus that he would continue to give you intimate bridegroom chamber experiences. Some of you may feel like you've never had one. Others of you have had encounters with Jesus, but it's been a long time. It could be many different ways. Maybe you just suddenly feel the presence of the Lord come over your, your life one day. Maybe it lasts for a minute, maybe five minutes, maybe longer. Maybe you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden you just start to weep. Something comes over you. Maybe the Lord revealed himself to you in a dream. Maybe he revealed his heart to you through another person. It could be any number of ways, manifold ways. But the point is that Jesus makes himself known. He makes himself felt to us in a very real and intimate way. And these are called bridegroom chamber experiences. Let's turn this into a prayer dialogue right now and ask the king, Jesus, to reveal himself to us in chamber experiences that we might run after him. Because his love, beloved, revealed is what gives us the passion to seek him and destroy every obstacle in the way. So King Jesus, we praise you today. We thank you for everything that you've already done. We thank you for wooing us, for drawing us. We thank you for bringing us to this place and to this encounter today. And we're asking you, King Jesus, our bridegroom, to reveal more of yourself to us. Even as the Shulamite bride, Lord Jesus said here, the king has brought me into his chambers. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus. We're asking you, great Yeshua Mashiach, our king and our bridegroom God. We're asking you by your spirit, by the Holy Spirit, to give us bridegroom chamber experiences, to give us fresh manna. We're praying, Lord, the way you taught us to pray. Give us this day, today, our daily bread. Make yourself known. Make yourself 
felt that we would repent from all sluggishness, from all slothfulness in seeking you, that we would discover in a brand new way that your name is more beautiful than purified oil, that you're a pleasing fragrance, that we would gain such a, a, a love and appreciation for you that we'd be able to run the race towards you forsaking everything else. It's in your name we pray. Reveal yourself to us, I pray, King Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's continue on. The king has brought me into his chambers. And then she says, we will rejoice and be glad. What's really interesting is this language here that she uses at the end of verse number four. The king has brought me into his chambers. And then she said, we will rejoice and be glad. This is the exact same language, beloved, that's used at the marriage supper of the lamb in Revelation chapter 19, verses number seven and nine. Let's go there together. I just want you to see this. Remember, I'm teaching that the song of songs is also is a prophetic shadow of our, our marriage relationship to King Jesus. It's about the church's relationship to King Jesus as the bride being presented to the bridegroom. So she says once again, the king has brought me into his chambers. And then she says, we will rejoice in you and be glad. Now listen to Revelation chapter 19, verse seven. Hallelujah for the Lord, the almighty God reigns. And then in verse number seven, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. Notice that. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the same thing that the bride said in the Song of Songs. We will rejoice in you and be glad. Song of Songs 1-4. Now Revelation 19-7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And then in verse number 9. Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. So you, can you see now that the Song of Songs, it's all about the bridal paradigm. You know, John the Baptist, he was the friend. John the Baptist revealed himself as the friend of the bridegroom. He was referring to King Jesus as the bridegroom. He said, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And oftentimes in the church today, we hear a lot of doctrine about the legal aspects of salvation. We hear about grace uh, and, and faith. We hear about repentance. We hear about end times. And all these things are critical. But what we don't hear enough about, beloved, is the bridal paradigm. That ultimately, where the plan of salvation is going is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the song of songs, beloved, is the revelation of this bridal love that the Father, that Jesus has for his people and that we have, beloved, as his bride for him. Let's continue on. She says, we will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. Now, the next verse is crucial. Verse number five. She says, I am black, but lovely. She's been touched by the love of the, of the love of God. She's been touched by the love of Jesus. She's encountered him. And when she encounters God in his light, she has a twofold revelation about herself. Look with me again. Very, very critical verse. Verse number five. She says, I am black, but lovely. Critical twofold revelation on. She's saying two things. She's saying, number one, I'm black, meaning that there's sin in my heart. Of course, in the natural sense, she was dark from being out in the fields all day. But we're looking at it from the prophetic sense, because remember, this was written by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's purpose is to glorify Jesus. So this is all about Jesus. The, this bride, the Shulamite bride, is a prophetic shadow of the church. I am black. This speaks to the fact, beloved, that we have sin in our life. The Bible says, he that says he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. Jesus said, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. So we have sin in our life. We, we know that. It's not that, we're, it's not that we're tolerating sin. No, we declared war on sin, but there's still sin that we're dealing with. And once we come up to the next level, God puts more light in our life so that we see even deeper levels of sin. But she also said this. We'll talk about this more on next week's broadcast. But she also said this. She said, but I'm lovely. She realized she had sin. I'm black, she said, but I'm lovely. You see, God loves you, beloved, and he loves me right where we're at, right where you're at, right where I'm at. God loves us. You're black. You still have sin in your life, but you know what? You're in the process of repentance and you're lovely to God right now. He will never love you. He will never like you more than he does right now. Father God, we want to thank you that although we're black, we're lovely to you. 
that you don't love us, Father, just when we get perfect, but you love us right now. You love us while our faith is still maturing, while our obedience is still growing. Father, we thank you for your love in Jesus' name and for Jesus' name. Beloved, I want to recount a supernatural encounter I had with the Lord in the night several years back. Paul calls it a vision of the night in the book of Acts. In this dream, I saw this man and I knew intuitively that this man was God's favorite preacher. And I wanted to know what made him so special to the Lord. Why was he God's favorite preacher? So I started following this man around in the dream, and eventually I was led down to a basement of a home. It was just a simple basement with cement floors and cement block walls. And in the center of the basement was a raw wooden picnic table with an aluminum can that resembled a soup can in the middle of that picnic table on top. And I knew that inside that aluminum can was the secret that would help me to understand what made this preacher so special to the Lord. As I extended my hand to reach towards the can, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And He said this to me, Because you know it was my word that saved you, you will never betray me. And that has given me such peace over the years to know in my heart that I'll always be faithful to God's word because he put it in me. He said, you'll always be faithful to me because you know it was my word that saved you. Beloved, we endeavor week after week to preach the word unadulterated. If this ministry is helping you and blessing you and you believe in me and in this ministry, I wanna ask you to support us financially. We read in the book of 3 John chapter 1, verse 8, that the church should support men that are preaching the truth. Beloved, God rewards us when we offer to Him our tithes and offerings, and it's part of being a disciple of Jesus. I want to ask you once again, beloved, for your financial support. God bless you. I love you. And I know that your support will come back to you in the Lord, pressed down good measure and running over into your lap according to the words of Jesus.